Welcome to another Sinra video. We're going to be talking watches with Mason. So Mason and I met a couple of months ago um, at a Chinese language course in Taipei. Yep. Um, and soon after we realized that both ourselves and another guy in the class all were, were watch, uh, watch enthusiasts or watch geeks. Um, and so we've spent some time and the more I look at Mason's collection, there are some really unique pieces in there and that really got, caught my attention. So I've asked Mason over to talk about his watches um, and let's just dive into it. Sounds so Mason, uh, tell us about yourself first. Oh sure, so um, yeah, so I'm originally I'm from the UK. Uh, I spent the last few years living in London, working as a software engineer, uh, and I'm currently in Taiwan. I'm doing some nomading, moving around uh, different places. So I spent the last couple of months in Taiwan, and next month I'm going to Japan, and then South Korea, sort of hopping around Asia, uh, while I work on a new software product. So I'm interested in starting my own business, and hopefully at some point it becomes a startup, um, for now, I'm just you know, working on something that I'm really excited about. So, uh, yeah, meeting new people like yourself. So, nice. So, far, so good. Nice, nice, nice. And what got you into watches? Yeah, I definitely wasn't interested in watches like I am now uh, for you know my whole life or since I was a kid. I originally had a Casio F91 mm -hmm. sort of throughout school. Uh, I always liked digital watches because you could just pretty easily tell the time. Yeah. Um, you know, very, very quickly. It was all about function. And so I ended up going the Casio route. And then when I got to university, I got into G-Shocks. So I got my first uh, G-Shock. I uh, can't remember what model it was, but I really liked the sort of form and also the ruggedness of those watches, the durability. The, just the fact that it was not going to run out of charge and uh, you know could go anywhere, do anything, completely waterproof and so on. After university, during the like, first few years of my career, I, I got the, well actually Casio brought out the all-metal uh, G-Shocks. Uh, the Casio, you know, uh, mm -hmm. steel, full steel options, and I really liked the gunmetal version, um, so I ended up getting that. It was, I think, my first fully steel watch, so I had like my first experience wearing an all metal watch, and mm -hmm. quite like that. Uh, that got me into watch YouTube and watch mm. content. Yeah, because I, you know, checked out reviews of those models and you know, speculation around those models and learned how they worked. Eventually, got interested in mechanical watches, and you know, through learning about all the different kinds. Uh, and then, of course, that's a complete rabbit hole. So I started learning about all the different kinds of movements, where different watches are made, the history behind different pieces, and here we are. I'm completely addicted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your current state of uh, watch collection. So what do you have? Sure. So my first, the first mechanical watch that I, I bought, a Farrah Eddington Moonphase. Once I got interested in mechanical watches, I then quickly learned about the British microbrand that we're using Swiss movements and making, you know, Swiss watches, um, but with British uh, teams and British design. Um, and I just thought that concept was really cool. Obviously, I'm British myself, so I have sort of a, an interest in that. But particularly with Farah, at a particular price point that was actually accessible, and then adding their own or building at the time their own design language and their own identity. Um, really interesting choices of color and very deliberate design that sort of uniquely yeah. theirs. Yeah, I just thought that was so cool. Um, the moon phase is a particularly romantic and you know not very useful one, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's also just awesome, you know. If you're, and then the the story behind Eddington, it's named after Arthur Eddington, I believe, he's a famous physicist. And, you know, there was a story about how it relates to his um, study of the, the stars and the cosmos, and I just mm. thought that was um, extremely cool. Mm. So that paired with the style of the watch, I just thought it was. I mean, you know, I couldn't resist buying it. Um, so ended up getting that. Uh, while that was on its way, my dad found out I was into watches, and he's a big watch guy. And we started looking at Christopher Ward. I think most of their stuff is is relatively conservative. Mm. They're, they're like serving a particular part of the watch market. I think they do a, an amazing job. Um, but at a level of finishing and design, and at a price point that yeah. is just incredible. Yeah. And also functionality as well. I mean, all of these watches have great water resistance and so on. So I became really attracted to that brand, and then they brought out this uh, C65 GMT, the Dune, um, which was a so limited you edition. Here? Yeah. It was a limited edition, um, one of 200. Uh, I just thought the design of this was more unique than most of their, their options. And beautiful, I mean, it's kind of part dive watch, part field watch. It has this cool interior bezel where you read the, the 24 hour time for your, uh, your GMT function. Um, so that was another one that I couldn't resist buying. 
and it was around my 28th birthday as well. So once my dad found out that I bought it, he mm. gave me the money for it, and it became like my 28th birthday gift. So it's sort of mm. that occasion as well. So yeah. I have an excuse now. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's always good. Um, and then around the same time, uh, he gave me uh, one of his tag Hoyas, uh, an Aqua Racer Hulk, um, which is an extremely cool watch, and it was my first dive watch. Uh, and obviously, it's you know it's from my dad, so it's a very sentimental piece as well. And it's not one that I'm going to be selling anytime soon. Um, the only thing with the Tag Heuer, particularly for a trip like this, I just wanted watches that were obviously functional, which is why I brought a GMT and a field watch, but also low key, mm -hmm. um, you know, not particularly attractive to, to other people, but if you know, you know. Um, and the Tag Heuer, it's a beautiful watch, it's a very cool watch, you know, any Hulk diver is like a, a cool design, but it's very in your face. Yeah, speaking of which, I guess the other uh, option that I have on this trip is my bronze Hamilton Khaki Field. Um, so the reason that I got this, obviously the, Ham the, the Khaki Field is like a classic, like legendary watch. Um, I love the story behind the Khaki Field. You know, being standard issue to US military back in the day, um, being a watch that was involved in you know, all those stories, it's extremely cool for that reason. And I think being able to get a watch that has that genuine history, history. at this price point yeah. is very cool. And yeah. I think anyone who's into watches pretty much will know what this is. So yeah. it's a cool conversation starter for people like us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I you've also made a, a slightly unique choice over here. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. This one's, this one's well, bronze. So uh, Apparently this is one of the most popular models actually. But, oh. um, it's interesting, yeah. So the standard khaki field is just insane value because it's this durable watch with all this history. Uh, but yeah, they usually come in steel. So I got the bronze version. I guess partly because I was a victim of marketing, but also because um, you know this watch was to mark my quitting my day job and coming on this trip and doing my own thing, mm -hmm. going on an adventure. And this is very much marketed as an adventure watch. And uh, the idea behind the bronze case is that it will patina over time and then sort of tell the story of um, all the journeys that you've been on with it and all your, all your time wearing it. Um, and so that was very attractive. So yeah, I mean, so far it's not patinaed all that much. I do wear it absolutely all the time. Uh, I've noticed some green spots, um, particularly with the Taiwanese weather, like where I'm sweating <laughs> when I'm wearing it, it starts to go a little bit green. Um, but I like that. I like the fact that it's going to age slowly and you know, over the next 10 years, I don't think I'll be getting rid of this watch so over the next you know, 10 years or so. I think it's going to tell a really interesting story of all the things that I've done while wearing it. So I just think that's really cool. And can you maybe tell us a little bit about your journey? So uh, you've started collecting watches for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. During that journey, how has your taste evolved? I think um, yeah, it's gone in a couple of different directions. So for one thing, you know, I, I think I was maybe a bit biased towards what the British micro brands were doing initially, and mm -hmm. I was, you know, as being someone who's new to watches, I was interested in, you know, Swiss watches specifically because of, you know, their renown and their history and so on. So I wanted to get a, a few examples of that, um, but then these watches occupy a price point that is accessible and, like I say, it's really great value for money. But yourself and some of the people that we've talked to in, here in Taiwan who are um, also watch enthusiasts, I've kind of opened my eyes to, I guess, a lower price point. Um, there's some really interesting micro brands from elsewhere around the world who will use Japanese movements or Chinese movements and produce some really cool stuff for the, for the money and really unique stuff as well. And that's really all I'm looking for is sort of a, a good value options where there's some intentionality behind the design. Um, so I'm curious, in, you know, in, maybe paying a bit less and getting some, some more value out of that end of things, getting into the Japanese movements, the Chinese movements. Um, and then we've been watch shopping here, going to various <laughs> boutiques, uh, wasting salespeople's time, um, but they're, they're very nice. And we've you know, had a look at some higher end options, I would say. Yes, we have, yes. <laughs> so some watches that you know, start at around five times the price of these. Um, that, I guess, has opened my eyes to that value proposition. So once you start getting to 3,000, 5,000 pounds, you know, up to 10,000 plus. Obviously that's a hell of a lot of money to spend on a watch. Mm. Um, but if you've got it, I suppose I'm learning more about why people uh, go quite that far, you know, yeah. spend quite that much. And there's some absolutely beautiful options from brands that I would never have looked at had we not you know, done some shopping and gone into those boutiques and had those conversations. You know, or maybe things that again, 
watch collectors might know and others might not. I really like yeah. that, you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. kind of an inside thing. Um, so I, I think I now, I, I didn't really have before, I mean, I was consuming Watch YouTube, I was always looking at, you know, Hadinki and um, looking at watch stores that, you know, I shop at and just scrolling and finding pieces that I'm interested in that are around similar price points to, to those that I've, I've purchased at uh, up to now. But now I have some ideas in mind about, you know, which direction? Yeah, yeah. more expensive pieces that in the future, I, you know, I know that they suit me now, that they fit my wrist and so on, but that I would really be interested in to mark those like, extra spe special occasions in the future if um, I'm in the position to spend that amount of money. So, yeah, I'm doomed, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some really interesting pieces from, you know, obviously, someday I would love to have a Rolex, someday I would love to have a, um, a Patek or something, but mm. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen, but you know, there's some really interesting pieces from the Breitlings of the world. Yeah, Breitling in particular actually have really surprised me, um, particularly with the you know, pieces like the Daytora and the, the B09, the Premier Collection. We just have some really beautiful stuff, and again, it's is it accessible necessarily? Well, at a certain point in life, I think it hopefully it will be accessible. Yeah, and yeah, for those extra special pieces, I, I have some of those in mind now. So. I guess my taste has gone in two different, two different directions ways. in terms yeah. of price, um, but I think there's value at every every level. So um, it just depends what you're what you're looking for and what you what you want to wear. So, but so far so good. I'm not I'm not looking for anything in particular. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we've, we've spoken about your aspirational pieces, yeah. but also the pieces in your collection. Mm. What about in the middle? What comes next? What are you mm. uh, What are you currently eyeing? What are you currently uh, looking to get? I mean, I'm always looking. There's always something that is taking my interest. I guess it's those pieces that kind of latch onto you and that you keep going back to. And at a certain point, I mean, so, some of my purchase decisions have been made because I'm spending so much time looking at a watch, mm -hmm. just over and over again, and mm -hmm. running through the specs over and over, and like, oh, should I, should I, you know, um, that it's going to be worth getting that time back. <laughs> so I end up just getting it. Um, that's been the case with some of these. Uh, the, the most recent, you know, um, case of that was with this Longines record chronograph, this black dial gilt, uh, gilt indice, which is just absolutely beautiful. Um, I found that originally looking around the boutiques in Taipei 101, mm -hmm. and now I've got one, so I, I got a crazy discount on it. I mean, it was really hard to resist for, for various reasons, but because of where we are in the world and through some negotiation, I managed to get a very big discount. So. That is my next watch that's on its way. Um, after that, uh, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I have an interest in getting some more divers. Uh, I've taken a real interest in the Zodiac Super Sea Wolves. Mm -hmm. um, as a, a diver option that has a lot of history to it, uh, but also I really love their designs. So it's a you know, legit Swiss dive watch, but they do have, especially Zodiac nowadays, They have, they're going in their own direction in terms of their designs. Mm -hmm. So they have these like punchy colors, these green bezels, silver dials, and these orange accents that really make that kind of watch a lot more appealing. Especially yeah. if you're going to spend that kind of money. I mean, there's also, they have a great value proposition as well. You know, you're getting all that with, you know, at a lower price than some of those um, other like heritage, heritage diver models. That justifies a bit more easily spending that kind of money on, on, a, on another, yet another watch. Mm. <laughs> so. Yeah, I really like those options. Ferrer also has a, an option that is really similar to a Zodiac Super Sea Wolf. And again, I mean, they bring their own crazy, funky designs to it. So it'll be between those two, I think. You've um, been doing your watch collection uh, for a while and you've mm -hmm. done a few different price brackets. Mm -hmm. What are you noticing as, as the prices are changing? Oh, um, well, I guess, so I started off at a middle sort of level, mm -hmm. at least in terms of mechanical watch collecting. Um, you know, with these micro brands that I think they represent, you know, crazy value. Um, if you want like a really well-made, durable, well-finished, thoughtfully designed, Swiss-made watch, right? Whatever that means. But, you know, my eyes have definitely been opened to the fact that, first of all, on the Japanese side of things, obviously Seiko is legendary and I think they do an, an amazing job. And I've seen some of your pieces and uh, some of you know, other friends' pieces. pieces um, you know, Seiko, Seiko options that are just amazing for the money. Um, and you know, they might even have mechanical movements in them, very reliable, 
um, they obviously have their their own following and the design and you know they mean something to watch enthusiasts and they're also very functional you know like the Seiko divers um, that are actually used by divers yeah I don't exactly. know how many divers out there like commercial divers are using um, you know 50 fathoms and like submariners and stuff nowadays but Seiko seems to be seems to be a pretty serious option so they have you know, legit credentials in that sense mm -hmm. at, a, at a you know incredible price point I think I need to to explore a bit more in that in that direction, and then as we you know explore the, the upper ends as well and get into the more expensive Swiss watches. Once I, you know my bar for expensive is um, well, all these are expensive, but my my personal like limit is uh, like my top end is like Tudor. So mm -hmm. I haven't yet gotten a Tudor. There's a couple of options that I'm really interested in, but starting around that like three thousand, five thousand pound mark and above, you know, getting into the tens of thousands. Um, I guess a lot of us go from this stage where we recognize that that's a crazy amount of money to spend on a watch, you know, yeah. something to tell the time. But as enthusiasts, you know, um, the further you get into this, this hobby uh, and the more that you actually you know, get around those kinds of pieces and you get you know, you know, hands on time with them, get wrist time with them, as we have, uh, you know, wasting people's time in these boutiques. <laughs> um, you do realize that obviously it's not uh, it's not linear so it's not that you, you spend more money and you get more in return necessarily I mean it doesn't work in linear fashion like that but you do realize that at these upper price points there is something additional that you get with those kinds of watches they're not necessarily better but they're just different Correct. I think part of that is the hands-on time mm -hmm. that they get you know if you're paying that amount of money well that money can go towards Someone you know who is well paid, who cares about watchmaking, is skilled. You know, uh, putting a bit of extra time and care into perhaps the finishing or the way that the watch is, is put together, watch to make sure that your individual piece is ready for whatever you throw at it. You know, the more I get into it, the more I suppose I'm comfortable with the fact that this is just this is an art form. It's a hobby. It's an art form, and. It's, you know, the question is, you know, why do you appreciate anything? Why do you appreciate the mu music that you like? Why do you yeah. appreciate the art that you, do you appreciate? Why do people pay a certain amount for a paint, painting, you know? It's just part of our experience and it's part of... Uh, yeah, you know, th there is uh, value there. Yeah, it's just knowing that it's been intentionally put together mm. for a reason, has been done in the past uh, for, for historical events. Mm. Uh, it's, it's the story plus the product, right? And if the product's done well, then it sort of stays on so long. Yeah. And if it's serviced really well, then it goes beyond beyond us, right? You almost yeah. get to pass it on, so. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, these things could, I mean, especially the higher yeah, price brackets and so on. I, I mean, even not, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, have had, um, you know, cheaper watches handed down to them and yeah. then you get into sentimental value and all this yeah. stuff. You know, I have this Takoya Aqua from my dad and that, it's not perhaps typically you know, the kind of watch that would be like a family heirloom, but the fact of who it's from is what mm. makes it special and imbues it with much more value than you know, the market price of that watch. So I'd absolutely never sell it. So you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, you get into the art of watchmaking, the art of the design of watches, and then sentimental connections. You know, what were you, where were you in life when you bought that watch? You know, who are you going to give it to? And um, where have you taken it in between? Where have you taken it? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that all imbues it with value, which I don't think you can really put, put, a, put a price on. And so the price conversation, I mean, when you look at it purely, you know, in a, in a sterile way of how could you spend X amount of money on, you know, something to tell the time, well, it's yeah. just not that simple. Correct. It's not that simple. It's, um, it's a means of self-expression. It's an extension of yourself. It's an art piece um, like any other. And so, you know, who's to say what it's worth? It's what it's worth to you, right? Speaking of self-expression, uh, I noticed that both of these are on NATOs. Yeah. Tell us about your strap game. Uh, are you a NATO <laughs> man, leather, steel bracelets? Yeah, I'm a NATO man nowadays because it's, um, I'm in Taiwan and it's uh, 35 degrees re regularly, you know, and crazy humidity here. So I did um, this Christopher Ward GMT. I'd love to wear it on the bracelet. Um, it, I also got a really nice uh, oak leather strap with it. Um, these micro brands do an amazing job with their accessories. and. It's an it's a awesome strap, I think it really suits the watch. But yeah, it's not very practical to be wearing a leather strap in this kind of weather. Mm. So yeah, I ended up getting a new NATO for this. Um, 
that I thought suited it. It's the, the June watch after all, the C65, so I got a, a sand coloured uh, NATO and I find this to be the most comfortable wearing experience for um, this, this kind of weather and actually just, you know, obviously super customizable. There's so many different kinds of NATO strap, but super easy to change. Um, super light. Super uh, light, yeah. yeah, I barely think about it. And uh, yeah, I mean, great value, particularly this one. I mean, I went on Shopee, um, which is like Taiwanese uh, Amazon and got four of these actually. And it was like, you know, five pounds per strap, which compared to like what I paid for this Hamilton NATO, <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely not worth the branded, uh, branded pin buckle. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of another, I guess, you, you know, you don't see many non watch enthusiasts wearing, wearing NATO, NATO straps. Yeah. And it's another avenue for that speaks. Yeah, you yeah. to be nerdy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> so absolutely. I get into the different kinds of NATO, you know, seatbelt versus nylon versus this and that, um, the different, you know, details. Um, and it's just a really cool means of customizing watches as well as being a really comfortable, practical option. And I find that, you know, it's a way of, as well as a way of customizing the particular watch, it's a way of uh, mashing the watch to your outfit so I can wear a sand colored NATO with a sand colored shirt and so yeah. on. Um, so it's just, yeah, a bit of extra fun and I think a very practical option. Um, so that's why they're on NATOs and yeah, I definitely think I'm a NATO guy. I love a metal bracelet, you know, wearing a fully steel watch is kind of what got me into the hobby. Um, but for practicality, for versatility, for customization, and just fun factor, I think NATO is a, a great option. So. Do you have any last bits of uh, advice for uh, people that are entering into the world of watches? Run away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, no, I don't think so. I guess um, that's something that I've tried to avoid is, you know, living for for other people, you know, buying, mm -hmm. in this case, buying what you want based on, you know, oh, I should have that watch, that watch, you know, everyone should have a Submariner in their collection, mm -hmm. everyone should have uh, this or that in their collection. I kind of agree that everyone should have a khaki field because they're so <laughs> cheap. <laughs> and, you know, to have a legendary watch for like 500 uh, pounds is kind of unbelievable. I always make jokes about the fact that watches are a, a means of self-expression for men. It's one of the few accessories that we have that we can play oh. around with. Uh, unless you're a very confident, you know, chain wearing, <laughs> nose ring wearing uh, guy. Um, but I, I really can't wear a, a lot of jewelry or a lot of different types of clothes. So these are a means of me kind of expressing myself and what I'm into. And obviously for a lot of people, they're, they're ways of starting conversation. You, have, you talk about these things, oh, why did you get that piece over this yeah. one, you know, and so on and so forth. Why did you choose bronze over steel? Um, so I think the main thing is, you know, the thing that I respect about other watch collectors and really enjoy talking to other watch collectors about is why did you make that choice? Um, why was that the right option for you and so on? Um, and the differences in taste is really something that makes it a lot more interesting. You know? So I guess for anyone else getting into the, the hobby, I would suggest just get what interests you. Yeah, what you like. Um, yeah. Don't do it because you think there is a, a certain, you know, Template. piece that you should yeah. have or a certain style of collection that you should have just whatever grabs you and whatever sticks I find get that and um, I think that's the best way to be satisfied nice um, I look forward to learning all about it when you uh, build your collection <laughs> having those conversations um, it's a lot of fun so yeah no uh, I, th I think that that nicely uh, sums up uh, thanks uh, thanks for your time and uh, if you're back in Taipei again uh, from your travels and uh, I think we should definitely catch up with definitely. some new watches that you're, <laughs> that you're eyeing. Uh, yeah, there'll probably be a few. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for having me.